My sermon passage is Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. <clears throat> now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. <clears throat> Truth is, I'm tired. Options are few. I'm trying to pray, but where are you? I'm all churched out. I'm hurt and confused. I can't fake. So what's left to do? Some of y'all know this gospel song, and now thanks to one of y'all, I know this gospel song. It's a beautiful, faithful lament by Tamala Mann, Take Me to the King. It's a brave song. Truth is I'm weak, no strength to fight, no tears to cry, even if I tried. But still my soul refuses to die. One touch will change my life. And then she sings, take me to the king. I don't have much to bring. My heart is torn to pieces. It's my offering. Leave me at the throne. Leave me there alone to gaze upon your glory and sing to you this song. You know, my <clears throat> in my young days, I was a gospel radio announcer, and that'll preach. The truth is, I am tired. I'm hurt and I'm confused. And I know I'm not alone. I know I'm not alone. Some of y'all, if not all of y'all, are too. I doubt sometimes. I doubt myself. I doubt my spirit. I doubt my eyes. I doubt my understanding of God, God's call, God's word. And as scandalous as it is for some people to hear, I am here to tell you that it's okay. It is okay to doubt. Look at the passage. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. They worshipped him, but some doubted. The blessing of doubt for us is that people in the Bible sometimes doubted, but persisted in faith. It's not one or the other. It's both. The disciples worshipped the risen Jesus, it says. The risen Lord was right there in front of them, it says, but some doubted. And there's more. Somebody who knows Greek, a PCUSA pastor, points out that it probably should be translated, when they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. They all worshipped, but they all doubted. And the New American Bible does translate it that way. When they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. That, to me, seems to be the meaning. Not that some of them were all in and some of them were not, Pastor Mark Davis wrote on his blog called Left Behind and Loving It. That's also the name of one of his books, Left Behind and Loving It, A Cheeky Look at the End Times. It's now in my Amazon cart. He declared, Worship and doubt are coexistent in this verse. Again, I say, Worship and doubt are coexistent in this verse. So, welcome saints and welcome sinners. Welcome believers and welcome doubters. Welcome to worship. We are all in this thing together. And I may be repeating myself, so I'm going to tidy it up. Welcome sinful saints, saintly sinners, doubting believers, and faithful doubters. We are all one and the same, and we're all a mess especially, maybe, after this week. <clears throat> we all saw and heard more outrageous words and actions by the current occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Northwest Washington, D.C. Through the din of a global pandemic, over the cries for justice in the streets, 
above the gasps and sighs from this nation's friends the world over, he actually trumped all other news and lived even further down to our lowest expectations by using a church and God's holy word as political propaganda. <laughs> I will not glorify the man by saying his name. And in this moment, I won't even say the name of the house he walked from to stoop to do it. With literal henchmen, scattering peaceful protesters, volunteers, and clergy from church property. I don't know about you, but it was about then that I and a bunch of folks hit a new bottom where doubt is thick, where it's a struggle to keep hope alive. And that was Monday. <laughs> Bravo, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser, for helping lift us back up by taking it to the street, the actual pavement at 16th and Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest with a team of paint rollers. Memo to occupant, big house, in giant yellow letters, Black Lives Matter. That was Friday. Well, between Monday and Friday, I had other doubts, some personal doubts, and some of y'all know because, as some of y'all know, I tend to let it all hang out on Facebook. So this is going to be a little personal. But I don't know of any other way to talk meaningfully about doubt. I got some news that really threw me. And Wednesday night, I posted on Facebook. I think God is closing a door I thought I was meant to walk through. Rather than assume God will now open a window, I think I'll just stop. I may have gone far enough. I'm keeping the details to myself for now. I wrote, this has nothing to do with my call to journalism or my call to ministry and certainly has nothing to do with my call to serve Trinity Presbyterian Church, PCUSA. I always have to stick that PCUSA in there because <laughs> we're different. I wrote, it may very well have to do with my uh, blankety blank pride prayers requested, I'm prayed and angered and saddened out, T-Y-I-A, which means thank you in advance. And more than a hundred people commiserated with me, leaving comments of hope and encouragement and prayer and some suggestions. And some suggestions were better than others. An old friend and a former boss, a, bo a former newspaper boss, not a former ministry boss, <laughs> a former newspaper boss said, it's always darkest before the dawn, my friend. I have no idea what you're going through, but my recommendations include the following. One, buy the best cigar you can afford. Two, buy the best bourbon you can afford. <laughs> Three, sit out on the front stoop and smoke the cigar and drink the booze with a little ice in every glass and think about what kind of motorcycle you can afford and then buy it and get the heck out of Dodge for somewhere like Colorado then go back to number one and number two until you feel like you can eat bricks for breakfast and burp the breath of the dragon. <laughs> Probably not the best idea, considering the nature of my disappointment, which was this. And it probably doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but it is to me. I have hit a wall on my language studies. As most of you know, I struggled through two semesters of Biblical Hebrew. I made a B minus in the first class and a B plus in the second class. That's not the problem. The problem is the first of two semesters of Biblical Greek starts this fall and some changes made to the program since I started it a year ago make it practically impossible for me to continue. So I won't. And here's why it's such a big deal to me. Honestly, it's the first time since 2009 in my call to seminary in my eventual call to ministry, that I've hit a barricade to doing what I thought was God's will, at least as far as ministry. And that kind of thing will cause doubt. At least it did for me. And that's why another comment on that nearly hopeless Facebook page gave me hope, but not necessarily that I would find my way back on track. Someone I don't really know posted this. Sometimes one has to go to Macedonia Sometimes one has to go to Macedonia, she told me. Well, that rang a bell, and so I googled, go to Macedonia. And there was Brother Paul, the apostle, being faithful but faulty, as usual, 
and this time he was faulty in his understanding of what God was calling him to do. In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verses 5 to 10, it says, The churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in numbers daily. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they had come opposite Mesia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, passing by Mesia, they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision, and there stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. Now, did you catch that? They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, and then they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Now, Acts doesn't say it, but somewhere between forbidden by the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them, Brother Paul surely had doubt. Had he lost confidence in his relationship with God? No. Paul wrote to the Romans, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep. To be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And let me add glory, hallelujah. That is that is the core of my of my faith. But at some point, Paul thought he was supposed to go to one place and do things, and he hit a wall. And then he thought he was supposed to go to another place and do some other things, and he hit another wall. He had to say to himself, I thought I knew, but I don't know. And that is doubt, a feeling of uncertainty. But whether he admitted it, or not, amid that uncertainty, he had a vision, and he saw Macedonia calling, and he went there. So this week, I had doubt. I had feelings of uncertainty. Some of you saw it and reached out. Thank you, and bless you. I have not been given a new vision as far as studying Greek, but honestly, by letting go of one thing, maybe I will see another. It could be something completely different it could be rest. And I do see that it could be that my pride needed taken down a notch. Paul's calling hadn't changed. The Lord just wanted him to go about it differently. My own call to ministry hasn't changed. But it seems like the Lord wants me to go about it differently, at least the language part, if that at all. But I don't know. I wonder. I'm uncertain. I doubt. I'd worked through it mostly by Friday, and on Facebook I posted, What a week! Spiritually and emotionally for me, it's been like playing dodgeball in quicksand. I've stood up, spoken up, laid low, leaned over, bent away, held my breath, held my tongue, held my head in my hands, hit the ceiling and the floor, and been mad, sad, and bad, and been blessed by the love of God in Christ through others here on Facebook, as well as directly, just when I needed it. And one of you left this comment. I can picture you doing all those things. Breathe. Thank you. And I can breathe. Jesus did not require his first disciples to be doubt free. He does not require us to be doubt free. Only to trust and obey. And that means love God, love neighbor, and love self. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, as the hymn says even if we're uncertain about the particulars. And even if they're pretty big particulars. Here's another gift of doubt from the Bible. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible, <clears throat> Mark chapter 16. After appearing to the Marys and to Salome, 
Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven themselves as they were sitting at the table, and he upbraided them for their lack of faith and stubbornness because they'd not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And in the next breath, Jesus said, Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. Listen, Jesus says, even if you don't have your story straight, even if no one believes you, even if you have serious doubts, go anyway and love. Go tell it. Go live it. Go love. That's what followers of Jesus do, doubts and all. It is so important for us to have one another's backs, especially when we are uncertain, and doubly especially during especially uncertain times. I have no doubt, pardon the expression, I have no doubt that the first disciples had one another's backs. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Maybe they all did. But what did they do? They went anyway, and they taught, and they baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching people to observe all that Jesus had commanded them. And that boils down to this. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The truth is, I am tired, and I know you probably are too. Apparently, there is no bottom to what the occupant in chief will say or do to promote himself. He will use the Church of Jesus Christ and its sacred places and spaces, holding the Bible like he wished he had on gloves and a mask, lest he accidentally inhale some of God's grace. Because when you breathe that in, you have to breathe it out unto others. We must pray for him, for his heart, for his soul, and for his mind, even with gritted teeth, even if we doubt. There are so many things we think we know, but often we don't, and it's okay to admit it to one another and to the Lord. We do believe, and we do doubt. Lord, help us in our unbelief. Sister Tamala Mann nailed it. So in the meantime, in these mean times, let's join her. Take us to the king. We don't have much to bring. Our heart is torn to pieces. It is our offering. Amen.